that cosier life was exclusive to those with education, with employment, and consequently, with money. But below that was the netherworld of the working class, or worse still, of the non-working class. For the escape from the land didn't succeed for all. Without education or a trade, without the good luck to be in the right place at the right time, they found they had exchanged a mean life on the land for a no less mean life in the city, amongst the landless, the jobless. They were huddled in the slums of Dublin, which were said now to be even worse than before the Second World War, when they'd been declared to be amongst the worst in Europe. In the tenements, a family might live in one or two rooms, sharing a toilet and a water tap out in the yard, with perhaps five, maybe eight other families. In Sligo town, open sewers still ran through the streets. They survived on casual work and through a remarkable system of sharing, born of the common bond of poverty knowing that next week your pot could be empty and you would depend on your neighbour for help. On Sunday, somebody might cook the staple cheap dish of the slums, a pig's head, its smell rising through the tenement. But the cooking water would go to the family next door to cook their cabbage and give it some flavour. Ironically, the slum diet improved somewhat with the economic war. Now that Britain wouldn't take our beef exports, the government gave the meat to the poor of the cities. But now, with de Valera's decision to open the public purse, an onslaught was to be made on the slums. New public housing schemes were to rise up in suburbs like Cabra, Crumlin and Marino. Thousands of houses would see families with low wages living for the first time in hygienic conditions, enjoying a garden, several bedrooms, living rooms and a kitchen with running water. But the heart has long strings trailing behind and many who moved to those suburbs all of two miles from the city centre felt isolated from and felt the loss of their neighbours of the slums. And it was amongst those of the slums that the scourge of TB did its worst and Ireland had possibly the worst rate of TB in Europe in the 1920s. Dublin, it was said, was riddled with it. A Department of Health official found himself confronted by cases of the last louse-born typhus in Europe. There were high infant and maternal mortality rates, and there were decaying dispensaries and clinics as the Department of Health had to fight for its share of scarce resources. Children in national schools were given a health inspection, and nearly 9% were found to be suffering from malnutrition. But touchingly, a mixture of shame, pride and ignorance caused parents to keep their children at home on inspection day, not wanting their plight exposed. The small sanatoria around the country were spartan in their resources and were feared as death houses. Few came out alive. So many a breadwinner who was struck down by the disease concealed the affliction for fear of losing his job. Besides, there was the shame of it. Unknowingly, he would often spread the disease to the family he was trying to protect as he worked on until he died. And for the breadwinner, the man of the family to die, meant certain poverty for all. There were no savings to tide a family over. At most, they might have managed to fund a penny-a-week insurance policy, but that would produce merely enough to pay for the funeral. For a woman to be left alone with the family was a fearful predicament. The 1930s saw the introduction of the widows and orphans pension, but that brought in the very minimum, literally, a widow's might. And whereas society at large resented women with husbands going out to work, taking men's jobs, it was said, it was seen as heroic for a widow to hold her family together by taking on a job, if she could find one. of the early years of independence, political leaders were consumed with law and order and economic stability, with the survival of the infant state as the air around it still smelt of cordite.
The health of the population didn't rank high in the priorities and budgets were being cut with penitential zeal. The state encouraged voluntary organisations to look after maternity and child welfare. Somebody needed to. 68 babies in every thousand died at birth, five mothers died too. And the infants who survived the ordeal of birth then had to battle with the challenges of enteritis, scarlet fever, diphtheria, the diseases of poverty. And who could say which children would find themselves struggling around on legs supported by steel rods, the bones within diseased by TB, or muscles attacked by polio? And while the state strove to establish a national health service, it was nevertheless the Rockefeller Foundation which gave the money to set up an experimental system in four counties. It was the Carnegie Trust which gave the money to set up a child welfare clinic in Dublin. The paucity of funds led to scenes worthy of Somerville and Ross's The Irish RM. On an inspection of the county home in Clonakilty, the gentlemen of the Department of Health were much impressed by the quality of the bed linen and towels though curious to understand why the matron engaged them in lengthy conversation at the door of every ward. Her job was to stall them while the staff whipped the linen from under the patients in the beds just inspected and installed it under the patients in the wards to which they were next headed. By the late 1920s, the finances of voluntary hospitals were in desperate straits. To save themselves, they ran sweepstakes on the better known horse races. By 1930, that had grown into the famed Irish Hospital Sweepstakes, which began to fund hospitals, which would reserve at least a quarter of their beds for non-paying patients. By the summer of the next year, the astounding sum of one million pounds had been raised, surprising even the sweepstakes' most ardent supporters. 90% of it came from abroad. Now they had the money to develop the health service they wanted. In the streets of the capital city, the sometimes cruel contrasts in what fate or accident of birth had delivered to different young people, a gap which might stay with them till death. But people made what they could of life with what little life had given them. In the streets of the slums, an old wheel became a toy to test your skills against the other children, hours spent in seeing who could make it go faster or farther. A halfpenny piece of chalk with an empty polish tin provided a game of hopscotch or piggy beds, though the boys didn't want to be caught joining in. In contrast, for their disportment, the children of the affluent could afford the bus or the train to the seaside. now the family might even have risen to owning its own car and that could bring its own unwelcome excitement with it. working class, that divide in life would be maintained by their inability to use the opportunity of education. It might have freed them from the cycle of poverty by lifting them up into a better job than their parents. But for most, education ended at the age of 14 with the primary certificate, with little encouragement from unschooled parents to carry on. Anyway, what meagre earnings they could bring in were badly needed, made by selling firewood or newspapers. These were the children for whom the Evening Herald newspaper set up its boot fund to buy shoes for the children of the streets. A child might graduate to even greater things, even to dealing in pigs in the back lanes of the city, if opportunity didn't slip from their grasp. They also became the messenger boys for the local shops or helpers on delivery carts. Dead-end jobs until they were 18 years old when they were thrown out to join the army of unemployed hoping for casual work. 
and so the cycle of poverty continued. The mystical mother figure of the state had many children, some strong, some weak, with different needs and all bustling to raise themselves up through change in our society or to see it unchanged and hold on to the advantage they enjoyed. But in that young state of so many divides, it was said that the binding cement was the Catholic Church. It was what bound most people together, the combatants of both sides of a civil war, both sides of an economic gulf, countryman and city dweller. They were one in that they were Catholic, most of them. They came together in the same church and prayed to a classless God. And that was to help sculpt the shape the character of the society we were to make for ourselves to this day. The vigorous censorship the day before yesterday.